professional engineer. Tom joined TVWD as the chief executive officer on August 1st of 2019. Fortunately, Tom enjoys adventures and extreme ones such as rock climbing, mountain biking, and wilderness camping. The past 12 months have served up some very adventurous <coughs> conditions for water quality CEOs, and Tom has the perfect blend of education, experience, people skills, and personality to lead TVWD through a global pandemic. Here you go, meet Tom Hickman. Well, thank you, Andrea, and to everyone who is joining our call today to hear about what goes into our TVWD rates. Uh, I would like to remind everybody to please put your uh, mics on mute or your, your screen on mute um, so that we can hear uh, who's presenting and, and hear everybody clearly. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I also want to acknowledge some of our board members who are also on today's call. Uh, besides staff who will be presenting today, we have three of our five publicly elected uh, board members joining us. Board President Bernice Bagnall and Commissioners Jim Doan and Jim Duggan, who are all listening to today's presentation. Uh, I would like to clarify for all of our participants, uh, and I'm sorry, you can advance the, the slides uh, there. Um, thank you. So uh, I, I want to clarify for all of our participants in today's call that this is not a rate hearing, uh, which is a formal process that our board undertakes every uh, other year as part of our biennial budget cycle. The biennial budget process looks at all proposed investments, costs of running the water utility, as well as long-term future investments, where a comprehensive rate is developed to pay for the utility. The board adopts a two-year rate based on this information, which they did in September of 2019. The next formal rate process will likely be scheduled for September of 2021, about a year from now. Today's discussion is only informational to help our customers understand both our rate making process, what goes into the rate at, at a pretty high level, and then uh, our rate decision making process. So, uh, you know, we, we certainly want to uh, have people participate, but um, this, this is where we're at right now is in the mid of our biennial uh, process. Um, and uh, the, the place where um, we look for our customers to weigh in is as we develop our budget, which will be starting here probably uh, January timeframe, February timeframe, and we put our financial plan together for the next two years. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, at a summary level, a great deal of work and complexity goes into developing water rates. While the delivery of water may seem simple when you are turning on the faucet, uh, what is not seen is the decades of planning involved to ensure the reliable and safe water supply that arrives to your faucet. There are many complexities that go into delivering this water sufficient water supply, water storage, water delivery, including hundreds of miles of pipes and pumps, and many other things, including the day-to-day -day repair, maintenance, and delivery. In addition, the water industry is highly regulated to protect, uh, uh, to protect, um, I'm sorry, uh, to protect consumers, and it is ever-changing. These regulations require constant monitoring and proactive measures to ensure we are in compliance. The point is, there are a lot of things that go on behind the scenes to make the water available at your tap. Many of the investments we make are decades in the making. These are not singular decisions, but rather a series of decisions that incrementally moves an investment forward long before any construction begins. These decisions can go back many decades, as you will hear from our program director for the Willamette Water Supply Project. In all cases, we look to not only plan for the project, but plan for the cost of implementing the project uh, by doing detailed That's cost right. benefit analysis and utilizing hydraulic and financial model modeling to help us in our decision making. A reliable water supply is foundational 
not only to each of us individually, it is foundational for an economy. Having a reliable, secure, and safe water supply is critical to business. In my many years in the business, uh, in the water business, I have seen businesses make decisions on locating facilities based on the reliability of water supply. It is a critical investment that we make for jobs today and jobs in the future. Each of us benefit by the many that came before us that made tough decisions to invest in our water systems that we all enjoy today. Each generation makes these investments for future generations to rely on, and TVWD is in the midst of a truly multi-generational investment and project in the Willamette Water Supply Project. The primary driver of our water rates is the long-term capital investments. Currently, Tualatin Valley Water District, along with the cities of Hillsborough and Beaverton, is investing in the $1.3 billion Willamette Water Supply Project, which began many years ago. We are currently in construction on many elements of this project and in the final design stages of several elements as well. Tualatin Valley Water District, along with Hillsborough and Beaverton, are committed to completing this project by 2026. During the life of this project, it is estimated that the project will generate more than 4,000 jobs in the re for the region. More importantly is that this project creates the foundation for future jobs in the region. The Board of Directors and the staff take their jobs very seriously, including our fiduciary responsibility of spending public dollars. We recognize that the events we are currently all going through have placed significant strain on our economy at every level and have put many of our customers in a very difficult financial situation. We have taken many actions to reduce our expenditures at the district while preserving our ability to move forward with projects that put us in a strong position in the recovery. To date, we have reduced our expenditures in this budget cycle by approximately $10 million. Our chief engineer, Carrie Pack, is working with her staff to help us reprioritize our investments in the district's repair and maintenance budgets. This has largely been achieved by postponing projects. These are not projects we can ignore forever, nor do we want to wait until fa failure to address them. But they are projects we can stretch out to reduce financial impacts to our customers. We continue to look for cost-saving measures across the district while still maintaining our ability to deliver a safe and reliable water supply to our customers. We have also worked closely with our surrounding partners in the industry, along with our professional industry, to work with Congress to get dollars to lessen the impact to our customers. Our staff and other regional staff began working with Senator Merkley's office back in 2011 to develop support and ultimately the passage of the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, or otherwise known as WIFIA. This bill has allowed us and our partners to secure more than $630 million in low interest loans. We are currently working with Congress and the EPA to secure a newer lower interest rate that is now uh, available in large part due to the downturn in the economy. So we're trying to take something that's occurred that's been pretty negative and, and turn it to uh, somewhat of a positive for our customer as much as we can. Uh, overall, WIFIA will save our customers hundreds of millions of dollars in interest over the life of a loan. The new interest rate we are currently working on uh, that alone is going to be is estimated to save our customers more than a uh, hundred million dollars over the life of the loan. You will hear from our CFO Paul Matthews uh, how this has helped keep our rates lower while making such large capital investments in the system. We have also worked with our region's elected officials to help secure emergency funds for our customers who are being impacted as a result of COVID. Washington County has made $3 million of financial, of eight, uh, financial aid available through the CARES Act passed by Congress. This money is available for those that qualify to help customers pay their utility bills in the region. We are reaching out to our customers to let them know about this money and how they can access it through the Community Action Network. 
In addition to the CARES Act uh, help and helping our customers in need, TVWD staff and board members contribute thousands of dollars annually to a customer emergency assistance fund to help our customers in need. Uh, all of this to say is we, we certainly understand the, the difficult times everybody is in, uh, and we are doing all we can to help those customers that are hardest hit uh, while at the same time trying to keep uh, the critical investments that we have lined up moving forward. We recognize these are difficult and uncertain times for everyone. We are doing all we can to ensure we can continue delivering water to all of our customers at the lowest possible cost while still maintaining high quality and reliability of the drinking water. While no one is excited about the need to do rate increases, it needs to be understood that the increases needed to pay for the Willamette Water Supply Project that we can't stop due to numerous contractual commitments made long before COVID hit us, hit us all. The Willamette Water Supply Project remains and will remain for several years to come the biggest ongoing cost the district faces. And while it is never popular to raise rates in any industry, it is important to maintain perspective that this natural resource is being delivered to you, to your, your residences and businesses 24 hours a day, seven days a week at a cost of about one penny per gallon. There is no other natural resource delivered to your home uh, at such a low cost. At this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to professional engineer David Kraska, who is our project director for the Willamette Water Supply Project. David brings decades of experience and a wealth of knowledge that is needed to successfully deliver this uh, large investment for the district and for the region and its partners. So with that, I will turn this over to David. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, as Tom as Tom introduced me, uh, my my name is Dave Kraska. I'm the Willamette Water Supply Program Director, and let's go to the next slide. And so my presentation for you today is to provide an overview of the Willamette Water Supply Program. It's a fairly vast, uh, multi-year, uh, complex effort uh, that we are uh, completing. And uh, so I pr provide, uh, going to be providing an overview of all of that um, and be able to answer any questions later on in this uh, program here today. So let's go to the next slide. As Tom mentioned, uh, the planning for this uh, effort uh, began decades ago and um, all the way back in the mid 1970s when um, when TVWD was evaluating its water supply sources back then looked to the future and decided to buy water rights on the Willamette River. Well, fast forward to uh, the late 2000s and right around 2011, uh, TVWD embarked on a, a more detailed study of its long-term water supply options at that time. Uh, that study was completed in 2013 and evaluated the four options shown on the graph graphic on the uh, right-hand side of the screen here, including groundwater wells to the north, um, purchasing additional or increased storage and additional supply from Hag Lake through the Joint Water Commission supply to the west, uh, providing or purchasing additional water uh, from the city of Portland to the east, or going to the mid Willamette River to the south. Uh, through this analysis, that was a multi-year effort, with a lot of technical analysis and also public input. Uh, the mid Willamette River was selected as the long-term supply for the Tualatin Valley Water District uh, for these reasons, lower cost, and that means less impact on rates, so lower cost than the other options being considered. Excellent water quality, as evidenced by the long-term use of, in the cities of Wilsonville and Sherwood. Ownership, um, purchasing and acquiring this supply provides ownership and control of the water source for the Tualatin Valley Water District. A reliable supply. This supply is being designed and constructed to withstand the, cascade, the, the predicted Cascadia subduction zone event. So it is intended to be the, the reliable water supply source to get us through that. <clears throat> and with a reliable, reliable supply uh, comes the reliable economic uh, uh, environment that we all enjoy. <clears throat> and then finally, fewer environmental impacts as compared to the other op options that were considered. 
uh, this option presented fewer environmental impacts and therefore was beneficial selection. Next slide, please. So with the selection of that source, we embarked on the Willamette Water Supply Program, starting with creating a mission statement. And so the leadership of this of the source and the leadership uh, spans um, spans uh, not only to Walton Valley Water District, but another benefit of this of this program is that it's a multi-agency effort. So we're combined with also the cities of Hillsborough and Beaverton, and with that created the mission statement that we run the program by. And I'll just read it out loud for you here. It's to provide a cost-effective, reliable, and resilient water supply system by, late, by July 2026 that benefits current and future generations of the communities, communities we serve and supports a vibrant local economy. So everything that we're doing on the Willamette Water Supply Program is to meet this mission, including completion by July 2026, which is really um, a need uh, for Tualatin Valley Water District and the cities of Hillsborough and Beaverton. Next slide, please. So an overview of what the project is, what is the uh, system? It's uh, shown on the graphic here on the right, it begins down at the Willamette River with a raw water intake. It's actually an existing intake for the Willamette River water treatment plant owned by the city of Wilsonville. That intake is being expanded for our purposes and a new pipeline designed to bring the raw water up to a new state-of-the-art water treatment plant uh, just in the east part of the city of Sherwood near the intersection of Tualatin and Sherwood Road in Southwest 124th. Uh, from there, the finished water pipeline continues north. In total, more than 30 miles of large diameter water transmission pipelines will be constructed and water storage tanks on Cooper Mountain will provide uh, peak supplies and also emergency supplies during uh, uh, limited shutdown periods. Next slide, please. So regarding supporting our local economy, I'm proud to say that to date, 95% uh, of the money has gone to local employees, goods and services. The, uh, the photo here on the right hand side is from Northwest Pipes Manufacturing Facility in North Portland. So it's great that uh, the benefit to this, to this region here is that almost all of the pipeline um, installed to date has come from this facility uh, just right here locally. Um, nearly all of the pipe, um, oh, and so uh, the total uh, spend to date is about 185 million. And so of that, uh, simple percentages there, the local spend to date is about 178 million. Um, in addition, all the contractors uh, from the area for our nine completed and active construction projects are all local contractors. Um, and to date, 212 local businesses have been involved in our work. Next slide, please. The colorful graphic here on the left hand side of the screen again shows our overall uh, water supply system, the Willamette water supply system, and the colors are meant to designate the various projects that the overall system has been broken up into. Uh, this was done intentionally to make sure the projects are right sized for local uh, contractors um, and, and also for better management uh, for various reasons of the overall completion of the project. Uh, so our progress to date is that we've completed four pipeline projects. Um, as Tom mentioned and Paul will mention in a little while, we've secured WIFIA loans that help, help the financing of the overall work. We've received our federal permit for this project. Uh, we've advanced 14 project designs and we've continued successful partnerships, not only with the cities of Hillsborough and Beaverton, but also regional partnerships, including with Washington County, where we've partnered with various roadway projects that they have ongoing to get our pipeline done at the same time and limit the number, the amount of public impacts from our construction projects. Next slide, please. So looking into uh, this coming year, uh, what do we anticipate doing? Well, we're continuing our local spend, and that means with the local contractors and other businesses that are involved in our work, continuing our local partnerships, we will have eight pipeline projects under construction and our raw water facilities uh, project down in Wilsonville is currently in construction. And we will be uh, continuing our regular community outreach for all of our projects, for all the local impacts and preparing for them, as well as outreach like what we're doing here today. Next slide, please. So with all the spend, um, it's really important to also note that we're, we take seriously um, our responsibility to be careful with the spend. 
And so the program employs robust processes to maximize value and control costs. And one of the ways that we found is most critical to this is maximizing competition on our contracts. And this uh, this is in respect to uh, to making sure that as many um, contractors and equipment suppliers and, and consultants can bid on our work as possible. We think that's very important for maximizing value of the work. This gets into right size in the projects, as I mentioned on the previous graphic. Uh, we've broken out the whole program into into project sizes that the large local contractors can bid on and also projects that are large enough that it will encourage outside contractors national contractors to be interested in them in them as well again to make it as, as competitive possible we do a lot of outreach with uh, consultant communities contracting communities and the, the other business communities to make sure as many um, many of those uh, businesses are interested in doing our work and we also prepare quality designs because we know that if we have we, we push out good design projects, more contractors will be interested in doing our work. We have continuous value engineering throughout the design process to again make sure that we're extracting as much value as possible from all of our projects. We track commodities pricing. So if, uh, if a case were to present itself where it made sense for us to um, invest in steel, for, uh, for example, uh, due to low pricing, we'd be able to do that. We also practice rigorous change management to make sure that we stay on track with the pro with the program that we're trying to complete and not get distracted. Um, claims avoidance and management is also very critical. It really starts with the quality designs that we produce and working closely with our contractors to avoid um, uh, claims and to manage them. And then finally, system tools for proactive control. Um, every dollar that's spent on the program is tracked to make sure that we know where it's going, what it's being spent on, and um, tracked accordingly. Um, regarding some data in terms of how we're doing, the uh, the box here on the right-hand side of this graphic shows you that to date we've bid nine projects. Uh, the total construction value of those nine projects is 153 million. That was our budget for them, as as estimated by our engineers and consultants. The contractor's bids to date is including contingencies, so that's money that we hold on each of these projects in case changes come up during construction, is, a, is 150 million. So the total bids plus the contingency is actually below our budget. So, so far so good, we're tracking 2% below budget on our construction projects. Next slide, please. And uh, thank you for your participation in the, in the meeting here today. I'd be glad to take your questions later on in this meeting. Uh, but for now, um, I'll pass the uh, microphone to uh, our uh, TVWD's Chief Financial Officer, uh, Paul Matthews, to talk about rates. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is an unusual way for us to do a rate open house, so I, I uh, beg your forgiveness as we go through this uh, unfamiliar uh, territory for us, but we felt it was important to spend a little bit of time uh, talking to you about uh, the district's rates and our plans uh, as we uh, build the program that Dave talked about as well as operate the district itself. Next slide, please. Uh, today we're talking about water rates. Uh, TVWD also bills uh, for sanitary sewer and for surface water management, both for clean water services and the city of uh, Beaverton. We do this to save money uh, by sending one bill and processing payments once. Uh, it saves both agencies money, uh, but TV did, TVWD does not set sewer rates and we do not set the surface water management rates. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is just uh, the water rates themselves. Uh, next slide, please. TVWD's uh, rate structure consists of two components. We have a volume charge, which is based on the amount of meter water use, and we have a charge per unit of water that we have there, as well as a fixed charge, which is based on the meter size, the size of the meter. Uh, next slide, please. TPWD undertakes a rigorous uh, business management, financial management process. This slide illustrates the four basic steps. It's an iterative process that starts with a financial plan and we prepare a budget, as Tom mentioned, rates, and then uh, we deliver those services. Next slide, please. There's a lot of details that go behind each one of these things. And of course, the financial plan is important for us as we look at the long-term impacts of our investments and the need for issuing long-term debt 
and communicating to uh, people, for example, credit rating agencies. The budget is a two-year spending plan that uh, follows Oregon local budget law and provides as a roadmap just for those two years. Uh, but based on the financial plan and the budget, uh, we then develop rates that are cost of service based, meaning that they're designed to recover from our customers, the cost of providing the services to each of the individual customers themselves. So not all customers uh, take water in the same way. And in fact, some customers uh, can be based on their peaking factors, more expensive to, to serve, some are less expensive to serve, and our rate structure and our rates are designed to take that into account. Uh, in addition to rates, we also have something called system development charges, which are costs that are assessed uh, for new development so that growth can pay for, for growth. Throughout that whole process, we have oversight from elected board. Uh, we have uh, annual audits that are required under Oregon law. Uh, and we submit our uh, budget and financial plan to uh, organizations external uh, to review those those documents. Uh, next slide, please. Like uh, most utilities and water utilities in particular, uh, TVWD has largely a fixed cost structure. I want to define a few terms here. Uh, fixed costs are those costs that do not vary with the amount of water that we deliver. So an example would be the cost of meter reading or maintaining our pipes or our facilities. Uh, the amount of water delivered doesn't drive those costs. Variable costs are those costs that do deliver, do vary with the amount of water delivered. For us, they're largely uh, chemicals, power, and some portion of our purchased water costs. If you can advance one click, please. Uh, recently, we did analysis of our cost and our revenues. And uh, our costs are about 88% fixed, about 12% variable. And this is typical for uh, water utility. In fact, our variable costs might be a little bit higher uh, than uh, others, our fixed cost a little bit lower than others as a percentage. Uh, on the revenue side though, about 19% of our revenue comes from those fixed charges. Uh, the other 81% comes from the volume charges. So in a situation where you have cooler weather summers like we had last year uh, or in a COVID-19 environment like we're facing now, we'll see that our revenues drop more quickly than our cost. And this is, of course, one of the financial challenges uh, that we face. Next slide, please. So uh, as a result of that, we obviously are in the business of managing our cost. If you could please advance the slide. Uh, presented here is uh, our cumulative operating expenditures that we've had over the past, since the uh, beginning of this 2019-2021 uh, uh, biennium. So we have a two-year budget and a biennial budget, and this is our current spending as composed to the budget. If you click one, advance one click, please. To date, we've saved about $10 million, as Tom Hickman mentioned earlier in his remarks, and we'll continue uh, to drive savings as we go forward throughout the rest of the biennium to help offset some of the costs related to, or some of the uh, revenue losses that we've experienced. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the key uh, findings from our current financial performance. Uh, first, our operating expenditures are under budget, as I mentioned. Uh, our capital expenditures are also under budget. Our water sales are below target. The system development charges that I talked about, and those are the, the um, charges that offset the cost of growth. Uh, they are exceeded target so far, but they may in fact be slowing. Uh, the district's financial performance is facing headwinds as capital expenditures for the new infrastructure that uh, Dave Kraska talked about uh, drive our business plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Presented here is uh, our capital expenditure plan over the next uh, 10 years. And as you can see, uh, let me orient you to the chart. The blue area is the expenditures of the Willamette Water Supply Program. Uh, the gray area is the expenditure for the other CIP projects here within TVWD. Uh, and that comprises our large investment over the next uh, 10 years. And you can see that right now we are in a heavy investment cycle as we build out the Willamette Water Supply Program and fund uh, the capital expenditures. Below that graphic, you can see the dollar amounts that are involved uh, within the WWSP over this planning horizon. We have about $550 million of expenditures. Uh, we're also partners in the Joint Water Commission. We have about $7 million planned there. 
And then within the TVWD, we have $403 million planned. That includes a large pipe uh, that will deliver the WWSP water into uh, uh, the Metzger service area and then on up into uh, the northern part of our, the northeastern uh, part of our service area as well. So all told, about $950 million of capital expenditures uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, next slide, please. We'll be funding that with uh, a mix of, of cash and uh, which will come from rates as well as SDCs, as well as long-term debt. And of course, the long-term debt will be retired with rate revenue. Uh, the bar charts that you see here, the bars that you see here, are our current uh, estimate of the borrowing that we will have. I think I lost the presentation. Uh, Frank, can you reshare the presentation? Or Justin, thank you. Uh, the bars that you see here, uh, the, the hash bars are what we call our WIFI load, the Water Infrastructure uh, Finance Innovation Act of 2014. That's a low interest loan that we are currently renegotiating the interest rate with uh, the EPA. Uh, that has literally saved us hundreds of millions of dollars in interest cost over traditional revenue bonds. Uh, we also plan on using traditional revenue bonds to fill out the rest of our borrowing. Uh, and this is all programmed in to keep rates as low as possible, but also uh, to meet the financial requirements of the district uh, to have sufficient revenue to pay off those bonds as they become due. Next slide, please. So as we developed our financial plan, our business plan for the 2019-21 biennium, a few things have uh, changes that are what I would describe as material changes have occurred. First, uh, lower water sales revenue. Uh, we've experienced lower water sales revenue uh, last summer due to weather, and we're experiencing lower than expected water sales revenue right now because of COVID-19. Uh, those system development charge revenues that I talked about, they are uh, lower than what we had uh, planned as well, and it seems that those are uh, could be slowing. However, that will ultimately be determined by the uh, economic situation. In fact, in the most recent month, they've come in above plan. So we're hopeful to see a return there. And uh, the most important thing that we're pursuing now is an initiative to lower the district's interest rate. Uh, our WIFI loan current interest rate is at 2.39%. If we were able to renegotiate that today and we're working with EPA to do that, it would be closer between 1.2 to 1.4%. That will, that will result in significant uh, savings to uh, the district and to uh, our customers. Next slide, please. Uh, given the uh, financial plan that we have, the board adopted the rates that you see on this slide. So effective November 1st, uh, 2020, the block one rate will go from 542 to 562. It'll go up by 20 cents uh, per 100 cubic feet of water. That's 748 gallons. Now this applies to the first 14 CCF per month or 28 CCF over a two month period. Most of our customers are actually billed on a two month period, but uh, for comparison to other uh, typical utility bills, we, we, we compare them on a monthly basis. So for the first 14 CCF uh, or 1400 cubic feet of water, that is at 5.62. Uh, for commercial customers, the block one is up to 140% uh, their 12 month moving average of water demand. And as I mentioned earlier, our rates are set on a cost of service basis. Uh, those thresholds and the rates themselves are designed so that customers who present a greater peak on the system and drive our overall system capacity cost will be paying a higher rate. And that's through that block two rate, which will be going up from $7.73 to $8.01 uh, in November of 2020. Next slide, please. In addition to our uh, volume charges, we also have our fixed charges that will be going up. Uh, most of our customers, uh, residential customers, have a 5 8 inch meter. And so for most of those customers, uh, it'll be going from 1640 to 1699. Uh, next slide, please. We compare this to our typical customer, and our typical customer is someone who uses 7 CCF of water per month. Uh, the majority of our customers use seven or less uh, CCF uh, per billing period. Uh, again, I said that we do bill typically on a bi-monthly basis. These numbers are presented on a monthly basis 
for uh, comparison to your other utility bills. Uh, for that typical uh, typical residential customer with that 5 8 inch meter and 7 CCF of water, uh, the monthly cost will go up $1.99. Next slide. For the above average customer, that would be a single family residential customer that takes almost 9,000 gallons per month, that's 12 CCF, it'd be going up $2.99 per month. Next slide, please. And for the rather large user, this is quite a bit of water, almost 21,000 gallons per month or 28 CCF, it would be going up by $7.31 per month. Next slide, please. Uh, so addressing our rate concerns, what have we been doing? Uh, first, we're managing our operating expenses. I demonstrated with the slide showing our cumulative operating expenses. We are also revamping our customer emergency assistance fund that Tom talked about earlier uh, to better serve customers need. And we've taken donations from our commissioners, from the public, as well as from our employees. In fact, if you would like to make a donation to the customer emergency assistance fund, we can certainly facilitate that. And then the third item we have here is the expanded customer assistance with funding from uh, the CARES Act through uh, community action. Uh, this is a program that will help customers with water bills that they cannot afford to pay for those water bills. Uh, again, that's a federal grant that uh, we received through Washington County and is administered by Community Action. Uh, and the last item on here is renegotiating our interest rate uh, with the EPA that uh, literally will be saving us anywhere from 100 to $120 million over the life of those loans. Uh, next slide. And that concludes my presentation. I'll turn it back to uh, Andrea Watson. Hello, actually this is Frank Reed and I'm here to go ahead and moderate the, uh, the question and answer session. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Paul and Dave and Tom. Um, at this time, we are gonna go ahead and take questions uh, regarding your rate questions. Uh, if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, which is one of the little bars along the bottom of the chat, or you can also type it in the chat. So at this, and for those of you who are on the phone, uh, we will call on you every once in a while and let you ask your questions as well. So now's the time to ask your questions. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we did get a few comments in the chat, the chat bar. So Lawrence Falkenstein said he, during the, excuse me, during the Willamette Water Supply Program presentation, he noticed safety is not listed. And then he also commented that recently cyanotoxin has been found in Sherwood and Wilsonville water supplies. So Dave, I don't know uh, if you want to um, have, if you have any comments on that. Yeah, absolutely. And and actually, Frank, there are three comments there, and I think they're I think all three are related. At least I believe they are. One is the one is as you know as you mentioned, there's the one comment about I noticed safety is not listed, and then a uh, from the same commenter. Most recently, cyanotoxin has been found in Sherwood and Wilsonville water supplies, and then there was another comment about the Willamette River has a dismal record uh of water i think it's of water pollution how will that be dealt with so let me take those together and um and and provide some thoughts and see if that answers the question or if we need some additional discussion uh but the um uh re regarding uh safety uh, the safety comment it's kind of a broad uh, category but assume the concern is related to water quality in the willamette river um, and, and a lot has been done um, over the last decades uh, to address uh, this. It's been well documented, the uh, historic pollution in the Willamette River and what's been done to address it. And most of those issues, I'd say most of those issues have been addressed um, in the Willamette River to the point that um, uh, people regularly take, take uh, part in, a, in an event that happens every year. Don't know if it's going to happen this year due to COVID, but a big event called the Big Float, where where people actually uh, jump in the river and splash around, and so uh, the the Willamette River has its issues, but it's it's gotten much much better over the year. And and in addition, a lot of those issues uh, happened and occur downstream of the falls. Uh, so it's important to note that that our intake on the Willamette River is upstream of the falls. Um, so all of that is is good, uh, but the Willamette River watershed is huge. It's it's very very large, 
and uh, and so we think it's uh, it's it's critical to take that into account and continue our message or our mission of protecting public health. And and to that end, um, the uh, I mentioned in my presentation about the state of the art water treatment plant. Uh, one of the things that makes it a state of the art water treatment plant is that we provide multiple barriers of uh, of protection from um, all constituents that might be in the Willamette River. And what I mean by that all constituents, well, typically when we talk about water treatment, there are three main categories of constituents. There's the physical category, which are things like just silt and, and dirt and things of that, that type that are in the water. There's the chemical type, like, like the comment here about cyanotoxins and other chemicals that might be in the water. And also biological, things like viruses and, viruses and cysts and other uh, biological uh, contaminants that might be in the water. And as I mentioned, we have multiple barriers for each of those. For the uh, physical, um, we have flocculation, sedimentation, and filtration, so two separate barriers that are used to remove those con potential contaminants. On the chemical side, uh, some of that is going to be taken up by flocculation, sedimentation. Some of it's going to be broken down by ozone. We have ozone treatment at the water treatment plant, or we will have it there. And also we have GAC contactors, so granular activated carbon, to remove the uh, chemical constituents in the water before it's, uh, it's, it's rendered potable. And finally, on the biological contaminants, uh, we have three separate barriers um, specifically for biological contaminants. Again, ozone is an extremely effective oxidant that's used to, um, to, uh, for, for biological contaminants. Ultraviolet light is also going to be employed at this uh, facility, which is, uh, which is an excellent treatment for both viruses and cysts. And also chlorine disinfection, which is um, just a long-standing disinfectant used for uh, for drinking water. In addition, the water treatment plant is also going to be designed with the capability um, of providing advanced oxidation in the future if it's deemed beneficial. If there are if there are situations where advanced oxidation, which means we would also be adding hydrogen peroxide to the treatment stream, uh, then then that can be employed. The uh, the treatment plant is going to be designed to accommodate that. Uh, so, one other thing that we're doing as part of our program and is, is that we're preparing strategies uh, for watershed engagement. Um, really looking to the Willamette River as a drinking water source um, highlights the value of the Willamette River uh, to all of those who use it as a drinking water source. Um, as I mentioned, our intake is going to be done on the city of Wilsonville, and uh, so we'll have the, uh, the three utilities here. Wallen Valley Water District, City of Hillsborough, and City of Beaverton are part of the Willamette Water Supply Program, and the existing utilities of City of Wilsonville and City of Sherwood that are all drawing from the Willamette River. Um, a sixth utility, uh, City of Tigard, is also part of this group that we call the Willamette Intake Facilities Commission. And so this commission is currently embarking on a mission, vision, and values uh, uh, effort to determine um, what, to what degree all of these cities and the uh, you know, Tualatin Valley Water District want to be involved in, sort of, in terms of watershed protection, watershed engagement, watershed policies. And I think this is going to be a real turning point in the level of, um, in the level of, uh, um, of, of uh, governance and protection of the Willamette River watershed upstream of our intake. And so um, that's kind of a highlight, a very, very quick highlight of all of the things that I hope are uh, are answers to those questions, but I'd be glad to uh, provide more information if it's needed. All right, thank you very much, Dave. Um, we got another great question from Connor, and Connor says, how do TVWD rates compare to other districts regionally and nationally? Justin, if you could go to slide 38. So uh, presented here is, are the uh, comparable uh, local utilities that we compare ourselves to. Uh, and this, this presents what the uh, typical bill would be again for that uh, 7 CCF customer, that's 5,236 gallons per month. A couple things to, to keep in mind about this is that TVWD is moving up the pack as we invest in this large water supply program. Uh, several years ago, we built, uh, in partnership with the city of Wilsonville, uh, the intake that uh, Dave Kraska was talking about just a moment ago. 
uh, down in Wilsonville at existing intake. And at the time they put their new uh, system online, Wilsonville was the most expensive uh, water provider in the region. And you can see that they're now uh, kind of moving down lower in the pack. And Tiger just completed its investment in the uh, Lake Oswego Tiger Partnership. And you can see that they are, are at the top of the list. So there tends to be churn over time. And we are definitely in an investment cycle. In order to do that, our rates and our typical bills will be going up. Uh, the other question I saw in the chat, and Frank, maybe you want to just direct to that. Maybe I should just stay patient, let you do it. All right. From well, this, I'll... I'll go ahead and go then. Actually, uh, you can stay on the line, Paul. Um, Don Howard had a couple questions, and I'll just take them in the order that he sent them. And the next one is, what is the total estimated rate increase based on an average household? So, Justin, if you could move to slide 32. So, the uh, typical the typical customer that we have uh, is that seven CCF customer at $1.99 per month, which is about a 3.6% increase uh, in their bill. So I'm hoping that I'm asking, answering the question that you were asking. Great, and then the next question from Don is, what are the metrics for, accept, for an acceptable water supply? So this is Dave Karaska. I think, I think that's a question for me. And, and I guess I, um, I'm not sure that I can I can state there are there are specific metrics. What I can state is back in 2015, late 2015, early 2016, we convened a blue ribbon panel uh, to look at what we're doing specifically as as it relates to water treatment um, uh, in general uh, or in specific in terms of what we're planning for the program. Uh, what in the Blue Ribbon panel um, consisted of uh, three local experts from uh, Oregon Health and Science, uh, from Oregon State University, and I think from Portland State, and then three national experts. And uh, we had a series of questions that we posed to them um, about the supply and about the treatment. And in summary, um, they, they looked at the supply and they found it to be very high quality. Um, they look, uh, especially those, uh, the national experts, um, are aware of waters that are treated by other utilities and, and used as, as, as uh, raw water sources for potable supplies. And they found the, uh, the Willamette River to be uh, superior uh, to many of them. Um, so I don't, I, I, so I think, I think there's not, a, there's not a, a succinct specific answer to that question, um, except to state that we've looked into it and we've uh, gotten um, independent um, um, approval or um, or uh, acceptance of the uh, of the Willamette River as a raw water source for potable supplies. All right, thank you, Dave. I know there's a few more questions in the chat, but I wanted to give the people that are on the phone a chance to ask their questions first, real quick, and then we will go back to the questions in the chat. So, for those of you that are joining us on the phone, are there any questions? Now would be a great time to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. I'll give you. Just a few minutes to do that. All right. Um, I will. Oh, was there somebody about to say something? Thought I heard the crackling. Nope. Okay. Well, let's go back to the questions in the chat then. And for those of you on the phone, I'll give you another chance in just a few minutes. So uh, continuing on with some of Don Howard's uh, questions, it, one of the things he asks is, so are we hoping there's enough participation in the Willamette water supply to protect it? Thanks, Frank. So this, this again is Dave Kraska. So, so I would say, I would say no, um, we're, we're not, there's not hope. Um, frankly, I, I want it to be the part of the mission. Um, and that's that's one of the reasons why TVWD is the managing agency for the Willamette Intake Facilities Commission um, spearheaded this effort to really um, get these utilities to talk to each other and agree on a mission uh, for this um, for this combined efforts and in, in getting involved in protecting the Willamette River watershed, protecting protecting it uh, not as, not only as an environmental resource but as a as a reliable water supply uh, for all of our agencies. Um, so um, hope that answers your question. All right, thank you again, Dave. So SE says uh, he. Uh, they had a comment. They said, thank you for your service in delivering us clean water and working to drive savings. Appreciated. Um, 
No problem, that's what we're here for, to provide quality water, customer service, and thank you for that compliment. Uh, Christopher McPhee says, since there are 24 seven monitoring systems and sensors on the water system, are those readings published in real time or near real time basis, both now and historical readings? Not just historical snapshots, but historical graphs and trends. And if this is not readily available, it very much should be for all sensors, including lead. Could I, a couple things there, uh, Frank. Frank, there, there was more to SE's comment. Uh, they had some great questions there, but to answer your, your question uh, that you just asked, that Christopher, Christopher McPhee asked, um, I would uh, like to see, I know Carrie Pack is on the, on the call, um, and I don't know if Joel is, but um, I believe either of those two are best to answer our questions uh, regarding the water quality uh, information. So, Carrie or Joel? Real time monitoring. So, this is Carrie Pack, and Joel Carey is in my office, so we're both here. Um, and whatever I say wrong, Joel will um, help me fix it. We, we do have monitoring um, programmed throughout the system. Um, we don't necessarily have real time information available and we have a little bit, uh, we're working towards getting real time information available and we have some minor data that's available. Whatever information we have, we can certainly have them available to, um, to Mr. McPhee and um, including all of the information about lead. The, monitoring data that we collect are public information and it's available for anyone that would be interested in um, looking at and we're more than happy to share them with um, anybody who's interested. And Mr. McPhee, if you wanted to shoot me uh, um, your information, we'd be happy to get together with you to talk about our data. Joel, anything to add? No, everything Carrie said is correct and yes, we do have a lot of data collection we do it's not quite real time but it's it can be considered awfully close and that's that is stuff that we our operators and our staff look at 24 7. so we're very active when we look at water quality across the system throughout the day and in the evening even in the weekends all right thank you very much se i apologize for missing your question so i'm going to go back to that and then I see that Stan has a, his hand raised, so I'm gonna to go to that, and then I'll go to Gary Hicks question. So I'll get everybody in order um, and we'll get there. So SE's question was, how many customer rate decreases are planned between now and 2026 as we continue to fund the WWSP? And also, when might the benefits of WWSP lower costs be passed to customers via direct customer rate decreases? Is this in the, about six or eight years, 2028? And then SE also says, as you might imagine, it can be easy for customers to conclude that we might never experience a rate decrease after long-term large cost investment and rate increases in WWSP. I think I will uh, address that. So uh, we, our current long-term forecast, we actually have a 30-year financial plan that we forecast out, and that's because the debt service associated with this investment is going to go out that long. Uh, we do not see uh, rates coming down in what we would say as uh, nominal dollar amounts. However, in real dollar amounts, when you take into account the effects of inflation, uh, we will see that uh, rates will decline in the future as uh, rates go up slower than, than the expected rate of inflation. Having said that, uh, we're using debt as a mechanism to keep rates lower now, and so that debt requirement will be pushed out. The WIFI loan that we talk about, the low interest loan that we have with EPA, is fully paid off and amortized through 2061. So it's a very long-term loan and we'll need to maintain the cash flow in order to uh, cover those, those um, uh, that debt. Uh, so it will, uh, it, there will not be a specific rate reduction where you'll see the rate go down. Uh, there's no plan for that. It could materialize if our costs to go up slower if we have uh, a major growth in customers that we didn't expect. Uh, but that is not in the financial plan right now. But we will see rates go down relative to inflation uh, in the future, but that will be well after the Reliant Water Supply Program is fully in place. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, so, oh, Stan, I saw you put your hand down, but if you still have a question, now would be a great time to ask it. Otherwise, I can move on. 
Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear okay, you. Okay, good. Um, I uh, I think that the um, decision made in two, 2013 to uh, go ahead with this project and ignore an, a long-term ordinance that had to do with uh, wanting the input uh, and and decision from the water users in 12 Valley Water District before making a choice to go to the Willamette, that decision to simply um, cancel that ordinance and decide to go to the Willamette without public debate, I think is something important to keep in mind, particularly since um, the Portland Water Bureau basically has been taking care of its watershed for us, and we have been enjoying the benefits of that, even even though the idea of cryptosporidium being in the water is not, you know, a very pleasant one. Nevertheless, we get good water and have for a long time. Uh, I think, though, if you look at what that means, that decision means for the district and the participants like Beaverton and City Hillsboro, it means that somehow uh, the Tualatin Valley Water District and Beaverton and Hillsboro and others really have a, a responsibility for managing, I guess, doing as much as possible to improve the water quality in the Willamette River Basin. And and, and yet the reality is that that work is already being done by Department of Agriculture, uh, DEQ in particular. And it's important, I think, for the board, the board of commissioners and the other participants in this project to be very clear about what that means for the program that will require money uh, to support public outreach in an intelligent way to bring up the level of understanding of what the situation is with uh, our withdrawal of water from the river. And it's not free of pollutants it's better for sure than the Missouri River and the Mississippi River where I lived and used their water in Missouri. But <laughs> uh, it's, it's not where it can be. And not only do citizens have to vote on the budgets for DEQ, but they have to, they have to be vigilant to see that what we can do uh, gets done, and also that what we know about the river improves in detail. What is really in the water coming in from sewage treatment plants in particular and agriculture, as I see the two main inputs of influence. So again, I don't think the budget for that on the part of the district has been crafted uh, I think it takes a lot of thought myself after exploring that since that decision in 2013. Uh, so. so Stan, this is Tom Hickman, uh, CEO. So um, I, I think we, we understand, you know, your concern is, is that with us committed to the Willamette water supply, um, that we need uh, additional commitment um, in terms of making sure that there's ongoing work to ensure um, increasing uh, water quality throughout the, the watershed um, for the Willamette and, and greater participation in that. And, yes. and, and uh, I, I can tell you that, that we are fully aware of that um, and it is what uh, Dave Kraska was talking about earlier, um, that we we are working with 
uh, the uh, Wilsonville intake facility group, that there's a group of water users involved there um, that are all uh, going to be uh, very engaged uh, in the basin, working together uh, with a single voice um, to ensure that we have uh, the highest possible uh, supply coming down the Willamette before we ever even treat it. Yes. Uh, so, so we we certainly understand the concerns, um, and uh, you know I, we do you know I, I invite uh, comments as we put uh, our next biennial budget together, where um, you will be able to see where are we making those investments in terms of staff, because that's really the majority of it is staff being able to engage at the regional and state level to to um get the the uh, requirements in place to make sure that we have the high quality water supply coming down um yes. so hopefully that that yeah. answers your your question and and uh stan i also would encourage always you know i know uh our staff is always willing to engage and and hear what you have to say and and uh make sure that we're we're addressing those concerns um, as much as we we possibly can. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thank you, Stan and Tom. Uh, the next question is from Gary Hicks has a great question. Then I'm going to go to the phones for another minute. Uh, Gary Hicks says what will happen to our rates when other water systems hook themselves up to the Willamette River? Uh, so this is Paul Matthews. I'll address that one. Uh, Certainly, if uh, if we have the opportunity to sell additional water, the economies of scale would take pressure off of our rates and allow us to have lower rate increases in the future. Uh, having said that, in our 30 year financial plan, we have not uh, forecast any of the benefits from that. So um, if it happens, uh, it'll be a pleasant uh, event for us. Uh, but uh, our current financial plan does not depend on additional uh, connections to the Willamette. Uh, to make uh, us whole. But in general, economies of scale uh, will provide us the benefits if we're able to uh, serve additional customers uh, if someone else hooks up to our water supply system. All right. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I would like to take this time to give the people on the phone uh, another minute to ask a question if you guys have any. Um, now would be a great time. Turn off your mute and ask away. All right, doesn't sound like anybody has one. So uh, let's go back to the chat. So um, so looks like both uh, Don Howard, Christopher, Christopher McPhee and SE were asking about some of the information on our water quality. Um, it is available on our website. So there's a great link there. It's uh, www.tvwd.org slash water dash quality. Um, and we have what we call our consumer confidence report. So a lot of our all of our water quality information can be found there. So um, hopefully that answers that question. If not, please put it back in the chat and I'll come back to it. Uh, Gary Hicks did have another question that says, what uh, what plans does TVWD have concerning global warming? Um, I, I can start on this, but I'll, I'll probably kick it over to Kerry, our uh, chief engineer. Uh, so, um, I, I think that we address this within our our water master plan plans um, and in our water supply uh, analysis when we're looking at available supplies. Um, I think one of the big reasons uh, to look at the Willamette water supply as an investment is it does diversify our water supply portfolio. Um, so uh, what we've learned is uh, climate change um, can hit not only an entire region, but it can be um, really, it can hit one basin harder than another basin. Uh, and so um, it's not something that's easily planned for, um, but we also have a really strong sustainability program at the district uh, and certainly hope to increase the strength of that in the coming years. 
Um, and, and that sustainability practice uh, is really trying to address what we can do to um, help re uh, reduce our contributions uh, to climate change. Uh, so we're trying to tackle it on a number of fronts um, in terms of supply planning, uh, as well as reducing what we contribute to it. Um, and then Carrie, I, I, if you wanted to add anything to that, I'll, I'll throw it to you. I, I would I would echo all of the, the elements that you mentioned as, as a supporting fact factual factors. Um, but also I would add that you know we, the district has a pretty robust um, conservation plan that we work with um, not only our school, systems but also with um, customers um, we have a a very um, robust um, curtailment plan that we um, provide feedback on the water management plan that's um, required by state law but also we not only is it required by state law but our plan actually really looks into how to avoid um, having to um, be under the you know be, uh, how to how to address drought situation and how to best utilize the limited resources valuable re resources that we have available to us in in the form of um, water supply so um in addition to like you know the, i don't want to say the cliche um think globally and act locally but it truly is something that tvwd tries to do we um act locally to impact the global issue of um, climate change um, in a bigger picture. All right, thank you, Carrie. Uh, Gary Hicks actually had kind of a clarification. So um, in regards to other systems um, attaching to the Willamette, the question he said, I was actually asking about river supply. If more systems are dipping into it, won't there be less water for all? So that is a water rights question, which is not one that I will answer. Uh, this is Paul Matthews. It's not a dollar and cents thing, so I'll pass that on. I don't know, Tom, you want to take that or? Well, start? I can start and then I might kick it to to uh, David Kraska. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's if you look at municipal supply relative to the flow, the, our municipal demand relative to the flow in the Willamette, it's pretty small. Um, but that we don't want to we don't want to diminish uh, the impact. So um, there was analysis done uh, in terms of us uh, taking that additional supply from the Willamette uh, that was done by state agencies, and uh, that is uh, we we certainly have to mitigate for any impacts that we're having, albeit very small. Uh, we do have to mitigate for that. Now, Dave. Uh, I don't know if you want to add to that or clarify anything I just said there. I will. I don't mean to pass the buck here, but um, I'll add. I'll add a little bit more um, uh, color to it. So, uh, the the availability of water in the Willamette is something that's regulated. Um, it's it's um, there 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 are controls placed over who gets to take how much water. Out of the out of the Willamette, and it's controlled in terms of how much needs to remain in the Willamette for the environment and for the fish and aquatic organisms and everything. How much is available for agriculture? How much is available for users like us? And that's all. There's there's permits and water rights associated with all of that. And that's that I believe is managed by the Army Corps. Um, I think our expert on on hand is is uh, Joel Carey, but I don't know if he's uh, available to provide any additional uh, information to answer that question. Hi, Dave. Yeah, Joel Carey here. Yeah, everybody got everybody's got the right thread. It's 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 a big issue. It's a broad issue. Dave is right too. It's the U.S. Corps. It's also the Oregon Water Resource Department. So, in in direct response to that question too, you know. And, and Tom is also correct when he says, you know, it's a small portion of that, but that doesn't mean we diminish it. It's it's part of how we look at water management conservation. All municipalities do that. And in the broader sense, you know, this gets looked at at a state level as far as what available resources are there. Our agency is responsible for tracking some of those flows based on our permits. Those are things that we'll monitor for um, as flows change up and down the river system. Um, and in general, you know, there is analysis that's been done as we pointed out that there is quite a bit of available supply within the basin 
for the next uh, several years into the next century. So that doesn't change the fact that climate change has an impact, as you pointed out. But nonetheless, you know, those are things that we will completely be engaged with as we go to the Lambda supply system and watching those flows and, and making sure, frankly, that we're partnering with those agencies that are directly responsible for that management. Again, U.S. Core, uh, Oregon Water Resources Department, you know, those are the agencies that look at the permits, look at the allocations and determine if there is available supply for um, all the needs across the state. And that does tie back into the conservation issues that we mentioned. That's why we have conservation plans, water management plans, and we work with our partners to make sure that we're doing everything possible to, to utilize those resources efficiently. Great, thank you, Joel. Um, going, or actually, you know what? Now I wanna give the people on the phone another chance to ask any questions. So if you're on the phone, you have a question, now would be a great time to unmute and ask us. All right, still nothing. So let's uh, let's go ahead and go back to the chat. So uh, Christopher McPhee, uh, I think going back to some of the water quality information that's available online that we were talking about before says uh, what's on our website is not anything like real time dashboard. Um, for example, the latest lead results are from 2019. When in 2019, it does not say. Uh, I very much would love to see the real time or near real time data that the website is doing behind the scenes. Uh, Don Howard agrees with Christopher McPhee's statement. Um, SE uh, agrees as well. Um, Christopher also says, I am very apprehensive about the Willamette water quality, especially on an ongoing, especially on an ongoing basis. Having the data publicly published is a very good way to reassure the public of the ongoing water quality. Um, so Andrea Watson, she posted the virtual forum. We actually held a water quality virtual forum uh, last month. And there's a lot of great information on that. So the link is in the chat. Uh, we can also, and it's available on our website, we can make that more widely available. So that goes a little bit more in depth about our water quality. So that's a great resource as well. Um, and then LSF uh, says, thanks for the link, Carrie. Um, and Christopher says, thank you. And Don says, thank you as well. Uh, Gary Hicks says, thank you TVWD for joining the digital age by producing these outward facing online meetings. So thank you for all the great thank yous. <laughs> Um, are there other questions? Um, either by raising your hand, you can type them in the chat, people on the phone, uh, unmute and ask us. All right, no more questions about rates or what, what your money's going for? All right, well, if that's the case, I think I will turn it back over to Tom. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, and again, thanks for to everyone who's participated. Thanks for the great questions. Um, we don't want to view this as the last opportunity. Uh, in fact, we do have time left. So um, I do see that somebody has their hand up and I would like to be able to call on them and utilize the time we've set aside here. So um, Frank, uh, I'm going to I'm going to override your ending to it, and, and uh, I'm going to go in order here. It looks like uh, Jane uh, had a question for us. Jane, uh, if you're talking, you're muted, and we need to, we can't hear you. Uh, not hearing Jane. Um, so, uh, so uh, Jane, if if you want to chime in uh, here uh, after this next one, let us know. Um, happy to hear any question comment you have. Um, Stan, you had your hand up, uh, and, and Stan, just so we can make sure that we're uh, we we can take other questions and stuff. Um, you know, try to get, uh, if you could, uh, directly to your question as quickly as possible. Thank you. And Stan, we're not hearing you, so um, are you on mute? Yes, you are on mute, Stan. There you go. Oh, 
Nope, you're back on mute. <laughs> there you are. No, you, I think you're double click. No, I just that. OK. I heard <laughs> recently that the Corps of Engineers is uh, at the beginning of a of a environmental impact uh, process for the Willamette River Basin. Could you tell us anything about that if you know what the, the point of that is? Uh, I know a little bit about it, but I think the two people that know a whole lot more than I do, uh, it's gonna be Joel and David. Uh, so do one of the two of you wanna jump in on that to answer that? Hi, Stan, it's Joel here. So Hi, I can Joel. tell you right now that the Corps is, embar is just, I wouldn't say just, but recently started that environmental impact statement process. What that's related to are changes in the way that they operate the entire Willamette Valley system. So it's still very early in the process in the, in the sense that that's a fairly comprehensive long-term approach. Um, that process began last fall with the environmental impact statement and will continue for the next uh, two to three years in their timeline as they work on the full scope of how their operations uh, might affect um, aquatic species, you know, endangered fish uh, in the basin based on those changes. So if you want to know more about it, we are tracking it. Um, that is definitely an issue that we keep tabs on on what's going on within the basin. Um, and it sounds like it's probably something you're interested in. So I, I'd be happy to continue collaborating with you on, on what we know about it and what we're doing to sort of stay engaged in that process. Good, good, good. Thanks. Yep. Um, so uh, I, I uh, again, if there's anyone else that has a last minute uh, question, um, I do see here uh, that uh, Don uh, said that he may have more questions and come to him over time. I just what I'd like to let everyone know is uh, we are here and we are happy to engage and uh, have these kinds of conversations um, and answer your questions. Uh, we fully appreciate, uh, you know, that there's there's concern about the new supply and, and wanting to understand the water quality aspects around it and how we're going to deal with that. Um, and and uh, we are open to having those conversations and sharing with you what we're doing, uh, as well as what we're doing from a budget perspective and managing uh, our funds. Um, so uh, with that, I, I don't see any new uh, questions or hands. Um, this will be I, something that we're, we're doing more of these kind of virtual forums. So. If there are things that you would like to see uh, us talk about um, and hear from our our staff here about uh, different things, uh, we certainly are open to hearing from you about ideas on what we can present on uh, to to help answer questions and and uh, just to help engage with you so that we know uh, what your concerns are and being able to address those directly. Uh, with that, I'm, uh, Andrea, I see you have your hand up and, and I'll turn it back over to you. Um, if there's anything else I need to add, let me know. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. I just did want to mention that all the participants who registered today will receive a short five minute post event survey. This is the second time we posted a virtual event for our customers. And we want to make sure that we uh, schedule future topics that you have interest in learning about. So we'll ask a little bit about that, but we'll also go about ask about the technology, the format and the presentations to make sure that these forums uh, continue on and meet your needs. So I just wanted to mention that. And again, we wanna thank you for joining us today.